Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love. It is the one thing that guides us through everything in this world. And we want to know how we can show love as your people toward victims, toward abusers, toward the world around us. And in every way we want to grow into your image, Lord. So we're going to talk this session about some tough things of how to love well. And we pray that you will guide us and give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, for starters, let me just mention, I've got a whole series that I've done with some friends that, uh, it's oh goodness, I think it's like seven hours long, more than that maybe. Anyway, on the topic of how to respond, how to identify um, genuine repentance, how to report, when to report, all these kinds of things. So we're really going to scratch the surface here, but I want to talk about some of the most important aspects of how the church can respond to sexual abuse. And if we have time, I'll have some time for some questions at the end. So if you have questions that aren't just specific to your situation, but things that can be helpful to everybody then go ahead and um, save those for the end and we'll try to talk about them. So here's a summary of some of the other things that we've talked about that are very relevant to what we're talking about in this session. Abuse will escalate at the end of time. There's no way around that. As the love of many is waxing cold, abuse is the natural fruit of self-exaltation and unbelief about the love of God. You look at history, every time a culture has wandered farther and farther from God, we've seen an escalation of abuse. And the times that God eventually said, I'm going to have to destroy, you know, cities like Sodom and Gomorrah, or the whole world as at the flood, or Canaan, the Canaanites, and in these situations where God has said enough is enough and I'm going to have to just do something that is very unlike what I want to do, those times have been when abuse was escalating in those situations. We know this from archaeology, from history, from other things. Um, so we should expect that abuse will escalate at the very end of time as God finally has to say, can't can't deal with it anymore, guys. We're going to have to wipe this out and rescue those who are being abused. And that's what the second coming will be. Satan also knows that abuse is one of his most effective tools to shatter families, divide churches, and generally destroy people's ability to bond well with God and others. This is abuse of all kinds, but sexual abuse is especially powerful because as we mentioned yesterday, it strikes right at the core of who a person is as a man or woman created in the image of God. So sexual abuse tells victims this screaming lie about the character of God, that God is not strong enough to deliver you, that God is not loving enough to protect you. And when we fall for these lies in any form, we start seizing up in, in anxiety and panic and fear and trying to protect ourselves, basically trying to be as strong as we wish God were to take care of ourselves or others. And when we believe God is not loving enough to protect us or to take care of us, when we start falling for the lie that God's love is not sufficient, we will find ourselves spiraling into depression, feeling that we're unlovable, going to relationships that are unhealthy out of desperation to find something that will satisfy that God-shaped hole inside of us. So abuse is a very central end time issue because we need to be able to tackle these issues in order to help members of our church be able to connect meaningfully with God, have meaningful devotional times. Um, I mean, how can you be close to God when you feel like He's a million miles away and he thinks you're ugly and disgusting and he wishes he'd never created you. And yet these are the things that abuse victims often feel. Um, so we need to break down some of these lies by showing the truth about God and confronting abuse. And um, of course, the rest of the world is also struggling under an unbearable burden of abuse. So many people who refuse to have anything to do with Christianity are where they are, either because they were abused or because they've seen how abuse takes off and they're just like, I can't, I can't believe that a God of love would allow this kind of stuff to happen. I remember meeting somebody when I was out selling books door to door and this man 
said, I'm sorry, I just don't have any interest in your books or Christianity because I can't believe in a God who would allow a little girl, and he pointed to a little girl playing in a yard nearby. He said, I can't believe in a God who would allow a little girl like that to get sexually abused. And that was one of the first times that I ever shared my own story with anybody. And I told him, you know, I understand that feeling. That's how I felt. But I was sexually abused and God has healed my heart and is continuing to heal me and has continued answering my questions and showing me that if he didn't allow bad things to happen, we would never learn how bad sin is. And the man, you know, finally said, wow, I can see that. And he bought a book from me. So God works in the midst of these situations to reveal who he is, how strong he is, how loving he is, not just in spite of sin, but actually because of sin, the universe is going to see how loving God is in ways that we never could have imagined if we hadn't seen the opposite of God's love revealed. So abuse gives us a glimpse into the character of Satan and the darkness of Satan shows us the light of God's love and how beautiful it is in contrast. So what can we do practically to fight the lies of Satan? First, I'm going to talk about children. What do we do to protect children from abuse as a church? Number one, and this could be a whole hour seminar all by itself, we must start talking about the crisis of pornography. An estimated 70% of men in the church and 30% of women are addicted to pornography, as in using it regularly. And about 88 to 89% of the most popular porn on online sites now involves violence or abuse of women or children. It's not just watching two people having sex anymore. And this is having cataclysmic effects on just numbing the frontal lobe of people's brains, making it so that not only can some people not even have physical normal sex because they're ending up with erectile dysfunction and other issues, but it also is causing people to in constantly look for newer and more intense experiences of sexual exploits. It's not a longing to connect meaningfully with the one person we've chosen over everyone else in the world. Pornography is exactly the opposite. It's using sex usually to exploit, to find something that's thrilling. And so you have to find something that's new, just like any other addiction. You have to have higher doses to get the same rush. And so with pornography, the crisis is now that many people have to watch if it's not something with multiple partners in the porn depiction, it's something more sinister to get that same rush. They have to have exaggeration, which can mean violence and, and very popular scenes of pornography now involve women crying and begging for it to stop and then seeming like they suddenly enjoy it, which gives a message, especially if you've got young people watching something this, like this who don't actually understand yet very much of what's going on. Um, it gives a message that, oh, this they really want it. They like this. This is the way sex is supposed to be. And it so profoundly defiles a picture of the character of God that it's perfectly horrifying what it's doing. Younger and younger children are being exposed to it. The last I read, the average boy is first exposed to, uh, um, exposed to pornography at age eight, and the average for girls is about age 11. Now, there are kids who are much older than that who haven't been exposed to pornography, and kids who are much younger. Three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds whose parents are watching it thinking, oh, my kid isn't going to get anything out of this. And then those children are deal dealing with nightmares and trauma and a fundamentally seared ability to see sex as a beautiful, loving act. So we must start talking about pornography. We've got to talk about it in our churches. We've got to talk about it with our children. There are good books out there that we can read with children to talk about, like Good Pictures, Bad Pictures is a, one book that I read with my children several times. Um, and helping children to understand that pornography is bad and helping adults to get away from that pornographic addiction. Of, of course, children are getting addicted as well. Many children are unsupervised on phones and computers. This right here is a doorway straight to hell for many young people. 
And they don't even know often that this is not an accurate depiction of what their parents are doing in love. They don't find out for many years that pornography is not depicting the way that real sex is. It's a, a misrepresentation and usually a very gross misrepresentation of what love is like and what sex is like typically. So we must start talking about the epidemic of pornography and what it's causing. More and more children are assaulting other children because they actually don't even know that this is not normal and healthy. They're exposed to it, they start doing it, and then they get branded as sex offenders themselves when they didn't even know and often have now seared into their brains ways of relating that are going to follow them all the rest of their lives. So we must talk about pornography. Number two, we need to teach children about abuse. Um, like my parents, many parents think, oh, I don't want to defile my innocent, sweet little children talking about ugly things like that. Some parents will even, as the book Predators by Anna Salter talks about, some parents are like, oh, you, you talk about that stuff, you just bring it on. No, talking about children, talking about um, sexual abuse and other kinds of abuse with children can be life transforming for them. If somebody had ever sat down with me for 10 minutes as a child and explained to me, if somebody ever touches you this way, it's not okay. You're not dirty. You're not bad. You can talk about it and we will help you. My whole life could have been different. So people must talk with children. We need to teach children um, about abuse. Oops, sorry. I'm getting off my... Uh, page here. There we go. We need to teach children what abuse is, teach children the right names for their genitals and things like that. People will give children the innocent, fun little names for their, their genitals, your cookie or your ding ding or something like that. And then when somebody abuses, teachers who the children try to disclose to don't even know what they're talking about. And then when the children do disclose, they think, oh, well, I told the teacher, she seems to think it's fine. Whatever is going on, children need to have adequate language. If the police are interviewing them, they need to be able to tell what things actually are and not be confused or confusing about whether this is okay. So again, there are very good books to help you teach children about abuse and tackle it as something that they need to know, but not as something to live in terror about. I don't live in terror with my children, and I didn't even when they were little. I focused on teaching them, listen, if somebody ever touches you in a bad way, if somebody touches inside your underwear or does something like that, you tell me, but are you the one who did anything bad? And they'd say, no, no, it's the other person who would be the one who had done something bad. And so you wouldn't have to feel bad about that. And I talked to my children about pornography and say, don't ever watch something. Someday something is going to show up on your screen like this. And when it does, because I know it will, someday they're not going to, we can't stop that. You know, someday when something like that flashes on the screen, look away, turn the screen off, call me. And above all, even if you watch something, even if you do something, you shouldn't come and talk to me about it anyway. Simple messages like that can be life transforming for children. Many children don't talk about abuse with their parents because they know their parents might freak out. And abusers are professionals at grooming children, getting them to feel close to them. And then through connection, emotional connection or fear or anything else, they manipulate children to stay quiet. An astonishing number of children are silent about their abuse and adults too. The majority of victims of sexual abuse and assault don't report. Why? many reasons, but largely because there's so much shame involved and so little chance of justice. But if we do want to have a chance of justice, we need to teach children about abuse and help them in a matter of fact way to know they can say no to adults. You know, we don't have to say yes to whatever adults want us to do. Why should we tell children they have to? This is where it leads into the next one. Monitor children watch what's happening with them, make sure that they're not just left to play um, unprotected in environments like after potluck and other places where somebody bad can do something bad. It only takes a moment. Um, I remember somebody who was abused 
when they were just a child running down the hallway uh, during church to go to the bathroom and somebody grabbed her and assaulted her. So be with children, protect them, but also very importantly, respect their boundaries. Teach your children. If somebody says, oh, I want a hug, come give me a hug, honey, and they don't want it, they can say, no, thank you. They don't, they don't have to be rude, but they can say no because it's their body. When children are taught that they have a body, they have boundaries, they can say no to an adult as long as they say it nicely, then those are the children that often predators will leave alone because they realize, oh, that kid might talk. That kid knows how to say no. And I, it's obviously horrific if they move on from my child and go after someone else's child. But all I can do is my best to protect my children and to teach my children so that if one of their friends is ever abused and they talk to my children, my children know what to do. I remember when one of my daughter's friends came to her and said, this guy did this to me. And my daughter immediately said, let me call my mom. And she called me and said, mommy, come over here. I need you to talk to my friend because somebody abused her. And that night we were at the police station reporting. This is why your children need to know what to do so that they are protected, so that they can help others. So when, when we come to the next point, believe victims. This is where a lot of people go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I know there are false accusations. Yes, there are, and we'll get to that. So just hold on to that thought. But believe victims, even while we ask questions. Statistically, 92 to 98% of the time, any report of sexual abuse or assault is considered to be, it is true, that that's the way it works. So about 95% of the time, if we just believed them when they said it happened, then we would be getting a correct report. It's about the same as other forms of crime. If somebody calls the police and says, my car just got stolen, about 95% of the time, they're telling the truth. They're not making it up. There is that 5%, but we don't make a big deal about that with car thieves. Why do we make a big deal about that with sexual assault? There are a number of reasons, and they're all bad. So when somebody comes forward and says, I was sexually abused or assaulted, believe them. Don't go, do you have any proof of that? I'm not going to believe that about that guy. He's a good guy and I've been really inspired by his sermons. No, believe them and also ask questions and do investigation, especially in this day and age when somebody is a, a sexual abuser, they should have some kind of, most of the time, they should have other evidence. There are usually other victims, as we talked about yesterday. The average child molester has 50 to 150 victims before first arrest and even more after that. So usually if we start doing an investigation, well, we don't have to be the ones who do an investigation when it comes to something illegal like that. We call the police and get professionals on it immediately. But let's say it's a pastor and a woman in the church who is not a minor says um, the pastor has been sexually assaulting me. Um, she may not be ready to go to police, but we can still investigate as a church. We can start looking into this. And most of the time, there's going to be a digital footprint. That's why you don't want to go talk to the pastor right away and say, well, somebody said you sexually assaulted her, but is that really true? Because, um, there are other ways that we can deal with. And again, when there's an adult involved, it's harder to sometimes persuade them to go to law enforcement and things like that. But ideally, law enforcement can seize technology and look for a footprint, see what's going on in the past. I don't know how many of you have heard of Larry Nassar, but he was the doctor who was um, abusing the US gymnastics team girls. And over and over, he got away with it. I believe about 500 victims came forward in the end after he was finally caught and arrested. And he'll be in prison for the rest of his life, praise the Lord, unable to finally assault any more young women. But hundreds of girls that he abused and over and over, he was caught. Girls came forward and told people in positions of authority and they were told, I know, Larry, he wouldn't do things like that. Or do you have any proof? Because he was a world-class doctor treating Olympians, he had an enormous amount of power and credibility. And over and over, victims were not believed. And he went on to abuse 
more and more victims whose lives are now shattered because of his choices and because of the choices of the enablers who refused to believe victims. And you know how he was caught. Once there were finally enough victims that came forward and police went to his house to search, his trash can was the key where he had thrown out some hard drives, but the trash truck had not come yet. And so as almost an afterthought, it seems like the investigators grabbed his trash cans, took them along and found hard drives with hundreds. I believe there were maybe even hundreds of thousands, but certainly thousands of images of child pornography. And that's what they could nail him on immediately. So don't go out there and immediately talk to the abuser and say, well, somebody just told me this because they're going to go out and start purging all of the evidence that they have, the emails that they may have sent. They may start threatening their other victims to make sure that nobody will talk. And even for themselves, they may go commit suicide. So don't just dive in head first and say, well, I've got to investigate and believe victims and ask questions carefully, get professionals involved in that investigation, but don't treat the victims like they're not telling the truth. Um, usually, I wanna say almost always, a false report can be identified and usually fairly quickly. Um, I've dealt with several false report situations. Um, one of them was resolved in about 20 minutes. Somebody had called up the victim and said, I'm pastor so-and-so, and then started making inappropriate and disgusting remarks. The woman hung up, reported, and within a few minutes, because she told a friend who called me, and so I started helping out with looking at what was going on in the situation. And once I talked to the victim, it was very clear Number one, we could track because it was reported right away. We could track where the pastor was. Number two, um, we found that there was somebody who was making these phone calls um, to random people and just identifying himself as these people and then making inappropriate remarks. So there was a pattern going on. And also, once the victim calmed down and thought about it, she's like, no, that wasn't his voice at all. I just assumed it was him because of what he said. So there are false reports, but they're extremely small numbers of them. And also when there are genuine false reports where somebody is trying to do something, um, like when there's an intentional willful false report, and as we mentioned yesterday, that's a form of sexual abuse itself, trying to destroy the life of an innocent person. But even with a false report that is intentional, usually, almost always, that false reporter has a history of telling lies or otherwise causing problems. Now, there are, of course, abusers often go after a person who has a history of not being believed. Maybe that kid in the youth you, um, group who has a bad reputation. Um, if you go to YouTube and you watch, look up Anna Salter, the um, the author of the book Predators, there are some interviews that she did with convicted abusers in prison that are positively chilling and that give insights into the way that they were thinking. And one of the um, videos that's clearest is with a young man who was a youth pastor who's just wearing a nice gray sweater and looks like such a wonderful, clean cut young man. And he lies at first telling all about how he was innocent. Then later he tells the truth and says, oh yeah, I had well, well over 50 clear, you know, assaults. And, and, and he explains how he intentionally targeted the particular young man who ended up putting him into prison because the young man had come from a bad situation. Um, and he's like, I knew nobody would believe him and they didn't. And so believe victims, even while we ask questions. Next, avoid dangerous situations. We don't need to put our kids into situations where they are alone with an adult who could do something terrible to them. We don't need to leave them on sleepovers with other young children who potentially are being exposed to pornography themselves and might try experimenting with things. Um, we need to have, for example, make sure multiple trained adult supervised children when you have childcare programs and things like that. Dangerous situations do happen uh, sometimes no matter what we do. We can't just prevent children from ever doing anything. My children are in pathfinders. They go on campouts. 
Um, they even have sleepovers some, especially now that they're teenagers and I know their friends very well. Um, but dangerous situations, most of the most obvious ones can be prevented by taking some of these other steps where we deal with pornography situations so children are aware, children know what abuse is, what it looks like, and we stay close, and especially when children are very young and might not know what's okay and what's not okay. We teach them to respect their boundaries. We watch them. We make sure they're not left in situations with people we don't know well, and even with people that we do think we know well. We need to be careful at all times to make sure that they are not left in situations where they may be exposed to something. I remember even when my daughter was must have been about three or four and we were visiting a friend's house and as we were chatting with the friends she walked into one of the children's bedrooms and I walked in there it must have been only two minutes or so before I said wait where is she but when I went in there on the tv screen which I didn't realize they had a tv in their children's bedroom on the tv screen was a woman's body lying on the ground with stab wounds all over it and blood pouring out and my daughter was so traumatized that for years she struggled with fear about knives and things like that, even had nightmares. Avoid dangerous situations, monitor children, because it only takes a moment to allow something to happen that could cause years of needing help in processing that pain. And then last but definitely not least, set up a verified volunteers program at the local church level or something similar. You know, their Adventist churches at this point are, should be requiring, I think all over the North American division, they're requiring verified volunteers, which is a short program that you have to go through a training about abuse and how it works in order to be allowed to work in children's programs and have to pass a background check. Now, I'll tell you straight up, a background check will catch a few people and then there will be a few people who will not take the background check because they know their record will show up but the vast majority of predators have not been caught and are not going to show up on a background check and probably would be able to answer all the verified volunteers program questions very smoothly and cheerfully without any problem so it's not going to filter everybody out but it helps and the uh, Project Safe Church program, this is something that so far only Lake Union has set up, but it's an excellent program where North American Division policy is actually being followed so that if an employee or a volunteer within the church anywhere is reported to have sexually abused or assaulted someone, then that report can be put onto the Project Safe Church website. Um, and, and of course, if there's anything that's illegal, that needs to be automatically taken care of by law enforcement. But the church can also do um, its own work to find out more. Sometimes there's situations that are abusive but not illegal, such as a pastor committing adultery. And that is still abuse, even if it's an adulterous situation. It's also an abuse situation because he is in a position of power, both spiritually and in other ways, typically with a person that he gets into any kind of sexual relationship with, or she, if it's a female pastor. So it's abuse for a pastor to get involved in a sexual relationship, even if it's not illegal. So for Project Safe Church, for example, if someone does engage in an appropriate behavior like that and they're reported on projectsafechurch.org then the the uh, lake union now has a group of volunteers who have been trained i helped do that training they've been trained in how to help that victim or reporter to gather the information and bring it to church leadership. And then there's also a sexual ethics committee pool. So they'll take members from that pool who will create a sexual ethics committee and evaluate the information intelligently. They've also been through thorough training. And these are professionals who have already gotten training, you know, maybe psychologists and nurses and doctors and people who already have a finger on how this works. And the sexual ethics committee will then give a recommendation to church leadership on how to handle the situation. So it's a, it's a win-win all the way around, honestly, even though it's not a perfect system in that church leaders don't have to have rumors flying around everywhere and they're trying to figure out what actually happened. Nobody wants to talk. I can't figure out what's going on. 
Um, and then they have to spend a hundred hours sorting through stories and interviewing people. And they're like, I'm not cut out for this. I do not have the training for this. Instead of all of that, people who care and who have the training can be the ones who support a victim or reporter through the process of gathering information, pulling together statement, going to law enforcement if necessary or appropriate. And then giving all that information to the sexual ethics committee that can now also evaluate intelligently and give a recommendation for the church. So these are some of the best things that we can do to protect children in our churches and to protect adults as well, uh, particularly with the Project Safe Church, so that we can make our churches a place that is not as likely to misrepresent the character of God. We want to show what God's love is like. We don't want to end up sending people spiraling out of the church and out of Christianity because of things that happen within our church. So what else can we do? Um, we need to love abusers better. What does it look like to love an abuser? Um, this is where we need to understand a little bit more of what this book, Redeeming Power, says about how abuse works. Abuse is all about power and control. Almost all the time you will find what abusers are really after is not sex, it's power. That's why many of them, while they enjoy molesting children, what they really get a kick out of is fooling the whole church into standing up for them. So they'll do that by going out of their way. One of the interviews that Anna Salter did the young man told how he would intentionally go out and mow lawns for elderly people and use his own money to buy food for those who were needy and things like that. Because he said, I wanted to be sure that if anybody ever came forward about me abusing them, that the whole church would rise up and defend me, which is exactly what they did. They said, no, no, we've known him since he was a child. He's just the most wonderful person. But when people who look wonderful have access to pornography, they can do more damage to their frontal lobes in two months than people could have in 20 years in history. You can feed yourself on evil that is just beyond the magnitude of the ordinary imagination. And then go to church and sing hymns and pray beautifully and do all kinds of things that nobody would even guess who you are. So when an abuser is caught, the first thing we need to do is remove power. We need to let them know that this is not working. Usually when an abuser is caught, they will lie. Then when they know they can't lie, they will, and they'll often, that's mixed with trying to find out what you know so that they can confess as much as you know, plus a little bit more to get credibility. And then they will give the sob story of all they suffered as a child or how terribly they tried so hard or how beautifully God has delivered them through their newfound repentance. And, oh, I've just had such a wonderful experience with the Lord since then. Uh -huh. Nonsense. If you haven't made things right with your victim and already voluntarily come forward to confess it and to give up power and to make everything right and offer to pay for counseling for them and things like that, you're not repentant. This is all made up. So remove power from an abuser. Number two, refuse to accept lies. And this is where, again, it's really hard because you always keep in mind, even if there's a 95% chance that this person is an abuser, and even if you do an investigation and you find, oh yeah, sure enough, they're addicted to pornography, they're doing the same stuff that they seem to have been interested in doing, um, and whatever they did to this victim looks like the same stuff they were doing online. Um, even if other victims come forward and say, yes, this person did abuse me, there is always still that chance even if it's a 1% chance or a half percent chance, there is still that chance that it's all a misrepresentation and the person's really innocent. And we always have to keep that in the back of our minds. But when an abuser tells the story to you, it's going to be very hard not to believe them. I'll just tell you right now, even when I talk with an abuser, you know, they tell me, oh, I'm just so sorry. I, I, I haven't done this in a long time or whatever it is that they're saying, we're going to want to believe them. Abusers know how to curry 
affection and and get people to feel sorry for them and to pretend no i could never have done such a thing oh this just breaks my heart you know how much i love this child i could never do such a thing i've fallen for their lies before myself refuse to accept lies if this person is telling the truth if they are a person of integrity they're going to appreciate that you're trying to do the right thing as torturous as it might be for them to have to go through that and we all want to protect children except abusers they don't they don't want to protect the vulnerable they want to exploit the vulnerable vulnerability is what turns them on they love that but they may be wonderful people in many other areas of life. They may be the same people who will stay up all night feeding the little kitten with a, a dropper because they wanna keep it alive because they have compassion for the kitten, just not for the child. I don't know how that works fully. All I know is that's the way it is. Many people will lie their way out of the accusations before it ever hits the light of day and before any of the other victims find out and can report. So when we put all the pressure on the one victim who is reported first and then compare giving equal value to each testimony, we often end up causing the victim to have so much pressure on them that they just withdraw. They just pull out of being uh, willing to even talk about it. And we cause tremendous damage. So we need to refuse to accept the lies and instead to start working right away on figuring out the truth. Now, part of that might be talking with the abuser, but remember, they have more motivation to lie than the normal person can possibly imagine and more experience in it. Require accountability. Um, when we know that someone is an abuser, especially, we can already require that they be accountable. Um, and this is where even when we're in the investigation phase, we can say, I'm sorry, we won't allow you to come to church right now while we're investigating this, while we're trying to figure out what's going on. As hard as it is, even for an innocent person, innocent people want children to be protected. So they should want accountability to be taken. So they should be helped with their issues of pornography or other things like that. And they need to have, when a person's truly guilty, they need adequate painful consequences to inspire repentance. If there's anything that can bring an abuser to repentance, it will be painful consequences. We see this throughout scripture. Um, we also need to protect both abusers and their potential victims by taking steps to prevent potential future abuse. That may mean banning them from church. And that's what I would recommend in general. And also cooperating with law enforcement where possible to achieve these goals of giving painful consequences. Jail is a place that protects both abusers and their potential victims from the abuse continuing. Is it fun? No. Do we want to send our abusers to prison? It's very hard, I'll admit that. We want to show love and we should show love. We must show love. But love is not soft, pink, fluffy stuff. Love is the perfect balance of justice and mercy together. Love does not say, well, I know it's been a while since you did that. And I know you hadn't confessed it until you were caught, but now you've confessed it. And we'll just be right here to surround you with support and protection and love as you recover. What we're doing seems loving, but it actually will probably prevent this person from doing the needed work of actually repenting. Think of it like uh, getting a dandelion out of your garden. Um, if you just quickly go out there with scissors and say, oh, here's a dandelion, this is terrible, and you cut off all the flowers and leaves, you can sit back and go, Phew, got rid of that. Looks so much better now. But what's gonna happen? You know, and I know, the dandelion will be back in a week. Why? Because we didn't get the root out. And for an abuser to become an abuser, there is a very, very deep root. So we have to help with the very, very painful surgery 
of the process of getting those roots out that led to a person being willing to do something so unspeakably like the character of God, particularly if they were in a position of spiritual responsibility. Um, this person has probably so seared their conscience that they are not going to be able to figure out, at least not quickly, how to stop lying. Um, I remember a situation where there was a, a child molester who was caught went to prison for it. And after he was out of prison, he started a ministry to help those like himself who had once abused children. So he traveled around doing seminars. He shared his testimony. It was all so inspiring. And he was even wanting to share his testimony at his local church and was actively involved in training the leaders at the church on how to deal with abusers, how to protect against abusers and all of that when he was arrested for molesting again. Because in the midst of that situation, he had so learned how to lie that it was second nature for him. So he was grooming and then molesting another child in the church. Why? Because he could. Because he was trusted and putting a person into a position of trust when they have already demonstrated that they use that position of trust in order to access victims means they should not be put into a position of trust again. We wouldn't think that this would be such a strange idea if we were talking about a church treasurer, right? Imagine that somebody had been a church treasurer and had stolen a hundred thousand dollars from the church. Not that we can compare a victim to something as paltry as a hundred thousand dollars, but Let's just make a scenario that's believable. Let's say that this person was a church treasurer, stole $100,000 and did not confess and was caught and, and it had to be proved through records. And they say, okay, okay, yes, I did. I, I can't deny it anymore, but I'm so sorry. Okay, well, we might let that person come back to attending church, but we're not gonna make them the church treasurer again, are we? And what if they have a pattern of doing this at five different churches, they've been the treasurer at this church and stole $100,000, then they get caught, they move on to another church, <coughs> excuse me, and steal $100,000 there, then they get caught, and they move on to another church. Five times this person does this and says, Oh, I'm so sorry about that, when they're finally caught for all of them. And then we welcome them to a sixth church and say, oh, wow, what would you like to do? Well, my gifts are in the area of handling money, and I'd love to volunteer to be the church treasurer. Would we put them in as a church treasurer? Well, I hope not. And yet, I dealt with a situation exactly like that, where someone had five different known victims who this man had abused in a position of trust and spiritual responsibility, intentionally targeting them and harming them profoundly. And yet he was put in as a Sabbath school teacher for his favorite age group, college age students. Why? Well, I tried to talk with the pastor and said, what, what is your thought process here? This guy is dangerous. And he said, well, I just believe in grace. I believe in forgiveness. No, I believe you're being foolish. But no matter what, I couldn't do anything to reason with that pastor. And so as far as I know, the man is still teaching Sabbath school for his favorite age group. And I guarantee you, he will abuse again because he's already lying about what he's done in the past. This is how abusers work. This is what they do. And the reason they're so successful at shattering life after life after life is because foolish enablers will not follow basic processes that they would use if they were protecting money instead of lives. So. Take steps to prevent abuse and cooperate with law enforcement. Do the harsh stuff because that is what it looks like to love an abuser. Now I need to go into this for a moment. What about false allegations? It's possible for multiple victims to come forward all making up a lie. Um, it's possible for a person who's mentally ill or who has a vendetta and wants to ruin the life of their ex-boyfriend or ex-husband or um, sister's ex-husband, let's say, you know, people can make up things and sometimes they do. Every time I do a seminar like this, uh, it seems like somebody does the, but what about Potiphar's wife? Yes, there are Potiphar's wives in this our day and they need to be dealt with severely because they are a form of sexual abusers. However, 
they're very, very rare. For one thing, and it should, should be obvious if you do anything when dealing with sexual abuse and assault situations, but um, alleging sexual abuse or assault is a very sorry way to get even with anybody because most of the time you're going to be the one who is accused of lying, <clears throat> even if you're telling the truth. As we talked about yesterday, only about one percent, about half a percent of rapists actually end up in prison, according to RAINN, the uh, rape um, it's a, a website that gives a lot of statistics and information about sexual assault situations. But what about the ones that are falsely accused? Statistically, I just want to say, <clears throat> as we mentioned already yesterday, um, about one in six men are sexually assaulted themselves, uh, boys or men. So they're far more likely to be sexually assaulted than to be falsely accused of sexual assault. And guys, whoever's watching this, just realize you, you don't walk through dark parking lots with your keys laced between your fingers, terrified that somebody's going to come after you and you're going to have to try to punch them to fight because otherwise they might sexually assault you. You probably aren't shining your flashlight from your phone into the back of your car every time you get in a dark place to make sure nobody's in the back ready to assault you. Um, you probably aren't continually watching and being careful. Men tend to be afraid somebody's going to steal their wallet, not somebody's going to rape them. If men are not living in constant terror of being sexually assaulted, why not? Well, it's not that it doesn't happen, but it's that most men assume it's not going to happen as far as the likelihood. Um, there still is a significant likelihood that it will happen, particularly if you get yourself drunk and you're in a, a bad situation or if you're a child who is placed in a situation where you're not safe maybe in foster care or something like that so men are statistically quite likely to be sexually assaulted one in six and some people say it's more than that but how likely are they to be falsely accused of sexual assault it's really kind of it's very difficult to find any statistics on that but we know is it's extremely unlikely especially if you don't put yourself in situations where you're driving alone with vulnerable people who might allege that you had sexually assaulted them or playing wrestling games with young men who you could accidentally touch in a wrong way and then they think that you did it on purpose. If you're not going out and getting drunk at parties where you don't even remember what you did later and nobody else around you can testify in your defense, if you're not doing some of these obviously risky behaviors, your chance of being falsely accused is close to zero. So don't worry about it. Keep your office door open when you're talking with somebody. Don't go meet in a lone place late at night with somebody who is of shady character, assuming that it's all gonna go fine. Don't do stupid stuff. It's not complicated. All right, is it still possible that there is a false allegation? Yes, and we always need to keep that in the back of our minds in the midst of every situation, just knowing we're looking for what is most likely to have happened. But if we know right at the beginning, once there is a report, 95% chance it's telling the tr truth, then as we do an investigation, I believe we can get it down to about 99% chance we're doing the right thing instead of just 95% chance and maybe even higher. Uh, is there going to be a chance that false allegations stick and in that 1% or half a percent or even less, but those people who are falsely accused and have to deal with that for the rest of their lives, that is an unimaginable tragedy. And I really hate that it happens. And I do my best to make sure that false allegations don't stick, but we're not choosing here. Do we wanna ruin the life of an innocent man or do we want everything to go on fine? We're choosing essentially if we're going to ruin the life of an, an innocent person who may have been falsely uh, accused or do we want to ruin the life of an innocent person who has come forward because they were victimized and now they will be the one who is accused? So we want to do is what is statistically most likely to be the best thing. Um, now, when it comes to dealing with um, these situations, many people will say, well, I'm just going to leave it up to the criminal justice system. If he's declared guilty in a court of law, then I'll believe it. And sometimes even then they won't. But it takes an incredible amount of evidence to get a guilty verdict in a court of law. 
So I would say instead, we need to use the civil and not the criminal weight of evidence. Um, and this is what one of my lawyer friends talks about. When we're putting somebody into prison, we have to have 90% chance this happened or higher, as in they're innocent until proven guilty because until it comes to the point where it's beyond reasonable doubt that they did this, we don't wanna put them in prison. However, that doesn't mean that just because we can't get to that 90% chance it happened, 99% chance it happened that puts them in prison, just because we can't get to there doesn't mean that we have to throw away all the victims up until we get to the point where there's no doubt this happened. When a child comes to you crying and says, this is what this person did to me, we, we are not morally obligated to say, I'm sorry, your testimony is worth nothing because this guy is worth more than you. So instead, use a civil instead of criminal weight of evidence. And that means 50% chance plus a feather, whichever is more likely to be telling the truth. In a criminal case, it's the standard is guilty beyond reasonable doubt, you're going to prison. In a civil case, it's 50%. It's which one is more likely to have happened. So if the person seems like more likely than not, the abuse did happen, then we take steps to respond as though the abuse did happen. And we can do that within the church because we value both the victim and the abuser equally. We don't just go, well, we're going to say that the predator is the one that we're going to believe until we see any proof, you know, that they actually did it. Instead, we'll say, it's more likely than not that this happened. So let's take steps to make sure that the abuser is supervised when they are around um, people at church and things like that. So that brings us to the next topic. Should sexual predators be allowed to attend church? For one thing, there are many options for fellowshipping safely outside of church, particularly in the last year, we've seen that. A person can watch church online, pastor can go to their house and spend time with them. Um, other church members who are not vulnerable can go to their house and spend time with them. Sometimes the consequences of your sin are just plain gonna be unpleasant. That's the way it is. We can't fix the fact that somebody gets drunk and crosses the line and ends up in prison for killing somebody who was on the other side of the line. As much as they may wish they hadn't done it, consequences are there and they're real. Particularly when somebody has done something that harms someone else so profoundly, they just need to not be given the opportunity to harm again. So when we allow them to come to church, it's kind of like putting the person who is addicted to food working in the bakery surrounded by sweets. It's like putting the alcoholic in the bar and saying, well, just don't drink anything. Okay, you can just drink some lemon water you know, we put them in a position where their chosen drug is dangled right in front of them. And inevitably, they're going to have opportunities to access it if they want to. Because even if they can't touch anybody at church, they're making friends with people at church. They're hanging out with people who may not know that this person is a danger to themselves or their children. Then somebody else sees them in the grocery store and says, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. And before you know it, they're over for supper and they're getting unsupervised access to vulnerable people. So allowing them to attend gives them opportunity to go through that process of grooming potential victims and their families, even if they don't get opportunities to abuse at church. And think of that man that I described a little earlier who had abused, everybody knew that he had abused in the past. And his way of working through it was to say, but I'm different now. Now I'm doing seminars, now I'm healed. Now everything is different. And because the church trusted him, he abused another child, probably many other children through the years. But one finally was able to come forward. Um, this is the harsh reality. We can't just welcome everybody. If somebody had walked into a church and attempted to shoot a bunch of people, but somehow had been stopped, maybe they go to prison for a year for the attempt. But then we say, okay, well, he seems like he's sorry now. We'll let him come back to our church and bring a gun with him. This is what we're doing when we allow sexual predators to come to church. 
we're putting everyone else around them in substantial danger because even though sexual predators are humans just like the rest of us, they're humans who have dem demonstrated the ability to profoundly suppress their conscience. And they've demonstrated that they have a tremendous addiction and urge to harm other people. Sexual abuse is an addiction. You can't come to the point where you're willing to risk losing your reputation, your family, your relationships, um, your job, potentially even the rest of your life in freedom. You can't come to the point where you're willing to risk all of that for a five or 10 minute opportunity to sexually assault somebody unless you're deeply, deeply addicted and you just disregard all of those consequences out of the incredibly strong thirst to harm a person, to do something that normal people are horrified at. Normal people should be horrified at them. By normal, I don't necessarily mean everybody anymore because obviously a lot of people are devouring this stuff online in, um, in pornography. However, this is a terrible world to live in. And we're going to have to make some really tough decisions in order to keep our children as safe as possible from things that could profoundly harm their ability to connect meaningfully with God. So we're living already, in my opinion, in a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation, even to this same time. At any time in history, if a person wanted to violently rape and assault and harm other people, they had to go into war or otherwise get access to somebody. And whenever they did, they were at risk. If, if they dragged a woman off into the bushes and sexually assaulted her, then potentially her husband and father and brothers and uncles and friends and anybody else could come after this person and kill him. So a person who did things like this was taking a tremendous risk even going into war, you know, even if you think, oh, I'm going to be safe here and now I'll be able to get a few women to take home and sexually assault. And there are, there are some horrific stories like that um, that happened in history. But when those things happened, people were taking great risks. Now, an abuser can come home from work Friday afternoon, make himself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, rape for 12 hours, go to sleep. Um, get up the next morning, continue doing it, stop and make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich every little while and continue. And it's just unimaginable how much damage a person can do to their conscience in a, just a few hours of unsupervised access to unimaginable evil online. So when we say, well, seems like a great person to me, we're pretending that we can read hearts. So if you allow predators to attend your church, because some people are going to decide to go ahead and do that. And, you know, I realize there are different levels of predatory behavior, different levels of sex offenders. There may be a person who is labeled as a sex offender because when he was 18, he had sex with his girlfriend who was 17 in a consensual relationship, but it is still illegal. And that person may be marked as a sex offender. Then there may be other people who engaged in exploratory play as a child after they were sexually abused and then they do something to someone else they didn't know any better they didn't understand they go through therapy they're profoundly sorry and maybe they're not a danger to other people so there are different kinds of situations but anytime that you allow a predator to attend your church you're engaging in trust so make sure that you take steps to make sure that that trust is not abused Make sure their parole officers are aware and agree. Many times sexual predators will not warn their parole officers. They'll be out of prison, but they're not allowed to be in any place where they can be around children. And yet they may not be able to live next to a school, but they'll hop in, into their car and drive right to church and not tell a soul what they're thinking as they look at those beautiful, innocent children running around in the church foyer. So make sure that you follow the steps to get information about their offenses, to know have they abused children? Was this a repeat offense? Is this somebody who um, was 30 years old abusing a five-year-old? Um, which is just, I'm sorry, that person should not be allowed in a church, not when they're gonna have access to children. But people are gonna make that decision. So if 
let's say your church board decides that they're going to and you can't do anything about it. Do these things. Get the information about their offenses. Warn church members. People who have children in your church need to know because they may invite this person home. Well, he got up and sang that beautiful special music and I just thought that was wonderful and I love playing the guitar too. And so I invited him home. How are they supposed to know? And a genuinely determined predator will be guaranteed, will be cultivating relationships in order to get access to vulnerable people that they find attractive so that they can offend again. So it's a hard reality. Consequences follow all of our sins. And some consequences are profound, especially when we've committed profound sin. If an, a predator is allowed to attend your church, in my opinion, they should always have an accountability partner chosen by the church, not their random good buddy that they're like, hey, why don't you just come with me? Yeah, you know, I'm a good guy. Of course, or maybe even his predatory partner. And the two of them will intentionally abuse children. I know I say he, there are plenty of partner of there are plenty of abusers who are female too in fact i think that's underreported because they often abuse boys and boys are ashamed and people often don't realize this woman can be a predator too so there are sexual predators who are females uh, about 99 percent or so of those who are caught and charged tend to be males but still we'll be inclusive here have an accountability partner chosen by the church who supervises them at all times. That means going into the bathroom with them. That means going everywhere alongside them so that they cannot access somebody at church and they cannot build connections with somebody at church. Oh, let me just get your number. I'll text that to you. And now at least their accountability partner knows who they're targeting. We must do better at protecting our church members and our children. Now, I want to admit first you know, right off the bat, child molestation is not the unpardonable sin. Sin against the Holy Spirit is the only unforgivable sin. And while it takes a tremendous amount of sin against the Holy Spirit to get to a point where you can molest children or engage in sexually predatory behavior, this is not the unpardonable sin. Um, I myself am good friends with a child molester, a, a former child molester who was one of my best friends in high school. And I never could have imagined that he could turn out to be a child molester. He was honestly the first guy that I ever talked to about having been sexually abused myself because he heard that I cried in class when sexual abuse came up. And so he came to me and said, are you okay? Somebody told me that you cried about sexual abuse when it came up in class. And if you need to talk to somebody, I'm here and I'll talk to my mom and she'll talk to you when she comes and visits. And he said, I was abused when I was a kid too. And I want you to know you, you're going to be okay. He was so caring. He was so trustworthy. And I trusted him completely. But over time, he left the Lord. And he had never processed the abuse that he had been through as a child. And so later on in life, many years into his time away from the Lord, he ended up abusing children. And when he did, he told me later that he knew it was just a matter of time until he was caught. And when the police showed up at his house, he said, I was terrified, but I was also relieved because I knew I didn't have to live a lie anymore. But I didn't know that when I found out about his arrest. It was one of the worst moments of my life <clears throat> when I found out my beloved friend had been molesting children but mine was the first letter he got in prison. I wrote to him and I said, what you have done is just almost unimaginably evil, but the grace of God reaches to where you are. If you will confess and repent, God will be able to heal you and change you. He was in jail, he'd just been arrested. He wasn't already in prison yet, but in, in the jail, he received my letter. And he said, that was the first bit of hope he had in his life when he realized he could be healed of this maybe God could forgive him he had already at that point confessed everything to the authorities he told them everything he didn't have to they didn't have to go find out what things he had done because he told them everything he had been engaged in online um, exchange with other people of child porn so he pled guilty he accepted his sentence and he's in prison and will be until we're probably in our 70s, I'm guessing. 
but I wear this band on my arm all the time and I pray for him. And when he can, he calls me from prison and we have beautiful fellowship in the Lord. He's told me, I think there are maybe two other guys in this whole prison who are truly repentant out of the thousands. And most of them are sex offenders. He said, and there are just a couple that I think may be repentant for what they've done, but I'm doing the best I can to share my testimony and to share that God can heal us and forgive us and change us. And he asked me to tell his story because he wants others to know. I asked him once, I said, what would you tell people if you could talk to those who are like you, who have abused? And he said, tell them he that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. I trust my friend. I believe he's telling the truth. I still don't think that when he gets out of prison, he should be allowed in churches because I think we have to make a, a line somewhere that will help to protect children. Because if we let people like him come to church, even if they're genuinely repentant, what about the others who are not genuinely repentant? It's going to endanger children to allow them to be there. So when we know that somebody is an abuser or when we have strong indications that make it more likely than not that this person is a sexual abuser, we need to take steps to help them to repent. And far from that being cruel, it actually may be the thing that helps them to truly repent. Because this is how God shows love to abusers, by painful consequences. You look at the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Here is an abuser who is intentionally having the children of Israel beaten. And he's keeping them in slavery. And no matter what God does, he just hardens his heart. So what does God do out of love for the Pharaoh of the Exodus? This is what I have in my books, The Tales of the Exodus. I tell the story of how God is trying to appeal to the heart of Pharaoh. God gives him intense consequences, painful consequences, and he strips away Pharaoh's power. One plague after another shows Pharaoh, you are not a god. You do not have the ability to make the Nile run, to make the sun shine, to keep your crops to protect against disease. God strips away Pharaoh's power because he is confronting an abuser. And what does God do with Nebuchadnezzar? We know obviously Pharaoh didn't repent and he was buried in the Red Sea, which was a warning to all the other abusers in Egypt. Anybody who didn't get buried in the Red Sea had a fearful warning to them. And the worst thing that could happen to you as an Egyptian believing in the Egyptian um, belief system, the worst thing that could happen to you was to be buried without a proper burial. Now you would have no afterlife. And so when Pharaoh is swallowed by the Red Sea and they never find his body, that is terrifying. So God was warning other abusers through what happened to Pharaoh, trying to bring them to repentance. But we also see Nebuchadnezzar, who's another megalomaniac narcissist in the Bible, and God gives Nebuchadnezzar intense consequences and strips away his power. And what happens to Nebuchadnezzar? This is how God brings him to repentance. And this is how, if anything can bring an abuser to repentance, this is how you do it, by giving intense consequences and removing their power. And that's what led Nebuchadnezzar to become a person who wrote a chapter in the Bible. It brought him to brokenness, to repentance, to humility, to wanting to tell his story voluntarily of his humiliation, his public shaming that God gave to him as a gift to bring him to the kingdom. I'm not saying that public shaming is what we want to do to predators, but it's what sometimes is the only thing that can bring them to repentance. This is how you can tell a quick chart of the difference between true repentance and false repentance that still is cherishing sin against the Holy Spirit. True repentance will confess and will confess everything. Like my friend did, he told everything he had done. It's not, well, how much do you know? Okay, that all happened and this little thing too in order to get credibility. A truly repentant person will take full responsibility. There will be no, well, I mean, you know, she was dressing really suggestively, but I'm just going to say I take full responsibility for what I did. No, you just did not take full responsibility for what you did. So when a person gives those little caveats and disclaimers, they're not truly repentant. Don't believe anything that they say 
because they are demonstrating a lack of repentance by blaming someone else for their choices. They're at least maybe they're on the process of coming to repentance, but they're not there yet. A truly repentant person will not blame. They will repent completely and seek to make restitution. They will look for ways that they can make up the harm that they have done to their victims by you know, paying for their counseling, by saying, I just want to say how deeply sorry I am. And when somebody, when you're wanting to see if somebody's truly repentant like that, have them make a written confession. And ideally handwritten, because later on, as abusers do, and this is how this works, they'll back off and say, well, no, somebody typed that. I didn't write that part. Make them write a handwritten confession. If they're really sorry, that'll, that'll be fine with them. If they're not, they're trying to avoid consequences, which is the false repentance. They hide, minimize, or lie, just like Adam and Eve in the garden. They blame the woman you gave to me, be with me. She gave me of the tree. And they play the victim like Cain. My punishment is greater than I can bear. This is how false repentance looks. So I'm not saying go interview and try to figure it out for yourself because predators are the shrewdest liars you'll ever come across. But this is what true repentance looks like. And if it's not looking like that, if there's any blaming, playing victim, hiding, minimizing, or lying, throw it out. It's not a true repentance. Now, there are so many verses about evidence for enabling perpetrators, and we don't have time to go through them. So I'm just going to talk about this very quickly. Judge not that you be not judged. Um, the answer for that is wicked men are found among my people. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless. So when you say judge not that you be not judged, realize God has called us to seek justice. When you say whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Um, Remember, that's for the victim, too, not just the perpetrator. You don't just do what a perpetrator wishes. And a truly repentant perpetrator wants to be in heaven. So do what's likely to bring both to the kingdom. When you say an accusation against an elder must have two witnesses, I've seen some tragic situations like this. Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27 talks about in cases of likely sexual assault, when several uh, factors point to this is probably true, even in a time when women were considered to be almost like goats, they were dehumanized in that culture. Still, they said if this situation exists and it's very likely that this happened, there's a death penalty on the basis of one witness. That's the only place in the Bible because sexual assault is so unlikely to be falsely reported. We need to follow Matthew 18, confront, confront the perpetrator one-on-one, -on -one, bring one or two more, only then bring it to the church, not in cases of criminal behavior. If somebody went and beat somebody else to a pulp or stole $100,000 out of their bank account, we wouldn't say, well, now you go back and confront him between you and him alone. And victims are not supposed to confront alone. That's not the way this works. This is more of a millstone situation where this is somebody who has harmed a little one and they need to be cast into the depths of the sea, not treated as though they sinned against a brother when your brother trespasses. When you say, I'm just going to assume the best, assume the best about the victim, not about the predator. David sinned, but he repented and wrote Psalm 51. Well, yeah, but we don't have a prophet here to say he's repentant. And David suffered severe life-threatening consequences. It's he said, she said, none of us knows what really happened. I'm going to leave it up to God. It's not my business. I, do hear, I hear these things all the time. Just know, good shepherds don't welcome wolves. They try to figure out who the wolf is in the flock. And if the wolf is the false reporter or the wolf is the predator, they need to get rid of that. Um, your chance of having a false report is very, very small. I'll just remind you of that again, but let's not reinforce a victim's warped picture of the character of God. And what about innocent until proven guilty? Because this is the thing people say all the time. We're not sending somebody to prison. That's a job that court systems, law enforcement deal with, but we can't just let it go when a predator has an average of 50 to 150 victims before first arrest. It's not loving to them. It's not loving to the victim. It means that probably both of them are going to be pushed farther down the path toward hell. And declaring an alleged predator innocent until proven guilty usually means declaring an alleged victim guilty of lying until proven innocent. Chances of getting it right by automatically siding with the alleged predator. I know I've said this, but that's just what people almost always do. Churches almost always side with the alleged predator. I don't fully understand why, even though I can explain it in seminars and we did yesterday. 
When we assume the victim is probably telling the truth, but we investigate immediately and thoroughly, we're much more likely to get it right, hopefully 100%. So that's a lot of information, but here is the summary. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. This is what calls God calls us to do. Now, we don't have time for any questions here. So I'll just say the SDA church does not have a global database of abusers. That's something they really should. Um, and I would like to see in the next five, church, in five years that our church would start making some steps like that. Your best bet is probably to push for your union leaders and conference leaders to call Lake Union. <clears throat> Talk to Nick Miller, who's the legal counsel for Lake Union, about the possibility of doing what uh, they've done, Project Safe Church type systems in your union and conference. This is actually North American Division policy. It's just not followed. So if you do that, that would be a first step toward moving to where we can have something more like a database. I've seen some terrible things done in the name of well-meaning Christianity. But praise God, I've seen so many good things done when church leaders are willing to rise up at any cost, like with um, Elder Cundiff uh, recently and dealing with the Sam Pippum situation. There are so many good godly leaders. So if you've suffered abuse and you're traumatized by what church leaders have done, I just want to tell you, it's not all of them. So... Thank you all, and uh, may the Lord bless and keep you. I enjoyed being able to get together with you. Sorry we didn't have more time, but I know that the Lord will continue teaching you and leading you. There's also a book called Safe Churches that I helped write that's very helpful in dealing with some of these situations too. Safe Churches, which you can find on Amazon. And it's goes through a lot of these principles and some other great stuff that everyone needs to read, really. So thank you all. Have a great day.